Welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer White with the Portage Park District and I'm so excited to have our guest speaker here this evening. Um, Joe DeFuria has been volunteering with the Portage Park District since just about the time I started at the park and he- I didn't know that. Yes, it was, I, I, it was my first couple, I was just a few months in when um, I met he and his wife at a Scenic Rivers volunteer training and said, hey, we could use some volunteers over at the park too. So <laughs> since then- And the rest is history. And the rest is history. So he is, he's just an incredible asset to, um, to the park. I, I really appreciate him being willing to not just share his love of moths with all of you, but um, also doing a lot of other projects um, in the park. Um, we've got a great group of volunteers. If you'd like to be part of that group, then please, by all means, visit our website, um, click on Get Involved, and you can submit a volunteer application. And our volunteer coordinator, Beck, would be happy to get you all connected and trained and and so we, we appreciate everybody who um, gives their time and talent and energy to the parks. Tonight, Joe is sharing, um, well, it's one of my favorite topics. I love insects of all kinds, um, but he is going to be sharing information about uh, moths and his introduction to mothing. And um, some, he's doing some really amazing work. Um, he's very humble about this, but uh, citizen science is an incredible, incredibly valuable um, tool that we have in natural resource management. And Joe has been documenting the monitor on his property and uh, learning about them and keeping incredibly amazing spreadsheet <laughs> <laughs> of, what, of what he has seen there. And so he's going to share with you tonight about, about, the, about moths. And a lot of times people think of the lepidopterans as, you know, we think of butterflies and moths are as Joe's gonna point out, are very numerous and they're a critical part of our local ecosystems. So if you love birds or if you love plants or if you love other types of animals, um, the, the, the moths and really all the lepidopterans are a critical link on the food chain between, um, between those plants and animals. So uh, I'm so grateful that he's here to share with us. And I think you're gonna be super excited too. And he's going to allude at the end to some um, upcoming programs this summer where we'll be doing some mothing nights with the park district in cooperation with the ODNR's Scenic Rivers program. And so keep an eye on our website and in our newsletter for those programs because it's going to be fun in-person uh, mothing. So Joe, the floor is yours. All right, I have to figure out what to do here. So... Uh, are you seeing it? So click on that share screen. Oh, heck. I... That's okay. Just click on the little share screen and then it should, oh, there you go. Wrong. wrong. Have... Could you see that presentation? I can see that. All right. <laughs> so that one, so this is, well, right now I'm look, I'm seeing your, uh, uh oh. Yeah, it's okay. Just do do your stop share screen. I see your your browser. Mm, new share. Yeah, you can do new share. There you go. There oh, okay. Is. Discovering moths. All right. Well, obviously, I am not a PowerPoint expert, so this is about as good as you're going to get as my color letters on this PowerPoint presentation. But uh, so. It's about moth, mothing and mothers. I have to put a hyphen in there so it doesn't look like mothers. A um, couple other caveats. One, I do not pronounce a lot of these scientific names or even the common names very well. So take those with a grain of salt. And first time I'm presenting this program and Jennifer hasn't even seen it yet. So uh, here we go. Why doesn't, I guess we're not gonna go. Why is this not moving? Hey, Jennifer. Okay. Why doesn't my PowerPoint advance? On your screen, try hitting your enter button. The what button, N? Enter. Enter. Ah! There we go. Okay. Usually just a down arrow is dead. Okay. Um, and you can move, I guess you can move our uh, picture anywhere. Okay. Or even get rid of me if it's in the way. Okay. I take that Sounds into account. Uh, 
So what do most, do most people think of when they hear the word moth? Well, obviously, uh, there's little things that might eat holes in your clothes like this guy has on his sweater here. Or sometimes if you're driving down the road at night and your headlights illuminate these little tiny things flying around, well, those are moths. Or you're walking through your front yard and you might, you know, kicking up the grass and you'll have these, again, some little tiny white moths flying around. And that's, I think, what the majority of people think of when they hear the word moth. And, you know, you tell them that you're looking for moths and like, really? Like, why would you do that? Well, so, um, Again, probably what a lot of people think of just white, even though these are kind of pretty looking moths, uh, snowy geometer here, and this is a type of tiger moth, um, pretty much drab looking white looking moss, but uh, au contraire, um, there are 160,000 moss species in the world, and that's versus about 17,000 species of butterflies. So you can see, as Jennifer said too, a lot more moss in the world than there are butterflies. And all the pictures in this slideshow are all the ones, moths that I have taken uh, in my property here. And these are uh, some of the examples of the, the variability, uh, but you'll see a lot more of those through the presentation. And in North America alone, you have 12,000 species of moths versus about six or 800 species of butterflies. Uh, and in Ohio, just in Ohio, there are 3,000 species of moss uh, versus 100 species of 140 species of butterflies. So there are a lot of moss species in Ohio. Um, and a lot of people may ask, you know, what's the difference between a moth and a butterfly? Really, there's nothing specific that defines, well, this is a moth or this is a butterfly, you know, just by visually looking at it. A couple things that butterflies tend to do versus moths or the butterflies tend to keep their wings folded upright when they're at rest. Like if you ever try to take a picture of a monarch, it hardly ever has its wings open, always closes like that. In the antenna, uh, you'll see some pictures, different pictures coming up, but butterflies tend to have a small little club or a bulb on the end of their antenna. And those are, I, get, I keep using the word 10 because it's not across the board. So, uh, those are a couple couple of the major differences. <clears throat> but when it comes to uh, size and shape variability, moss winds, hands down, there are just so many different shapes, sizes, colors. Uh, it really is amazing versus butterflies. They all kind of, for the most part, <clears throat> have the same shape to them. A lot of colors and variability in butterflies too. So as we go on through the presentation here, every other page, I'm gonna interject pictures of moss that I've taken, uh, just so you can see all the different species. So it kind of breaks up the presentation, but it is what it is here. So <clears throat> rosy maple on the left, and uh, let me get myself out of the way. Uh, um, <clears throat> on the right is a, a crocus or a false geometer. And you might say, well, why is it an ore? This is one of the several of the moths that you really can't tell 100% visually by looking at it what it is. So you might have to do a uh, uh, dissection, but it's either one of those two different species. Um, as I said, the variety is amazing. Uh, so they could be very small. The one on the bottom left there, this rope is a, a quarter inch diameter Wrote. So this moth is really small, hence the cruddy picture of it. On the other hand, and literally as big as your hand, is the polyphemus moth. Uh, you can see the size of the clover. So it's probably about up to six inches wide wingspan. Uh, and uh, you can't really miss those. Sometimes you might see those during the day, like stuck to a side of a building, uh, kind of hanging out, waiting for a mate. Um, Hey, Jennifer, could you? Yes. Are the panelists able to see my picture in my, my box? Or Oh, of your face? Yeah. On, no, but I, never I mind. I, 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 just, I minimized it. OK, I'll keep going. OK, a couple of different carpet moss here. Um, now I see, Joe, now I have I see you, not your presentation. 
Oh, we don't want that. There we go. There you are. There's the presentation is up now. The slide is up with the okay. white carpet. Okay. A couple different types of carpet, uh, white ribbon carpet and orange banded carpet. And I get a kick out of some of these uh, descriptions of the moss. These are pretty much a no brainer, but uh, some of these people that come up with these names, I don't know. Um, so as we know, most of the moths are nocturnal and fly only at night. A couple of examples, uh, interesting one on the one on the bottom right, the tulip tree silk moth. Just that day, I was wondering like, why haven't I seen one of these things? My property was loaded with tulip trees and I haven't seen any. And it was raining out and I put my lights out on my porch and lo and behold, uh, tulip tree silk moth. Uh, for the most part, you could tell it's a tulip tree smoke moth with this T-shaped. It's not always a good indicator, but for the most part, I'll get you close. A um, couple more. Now you see the, the variability in, uh, in shapes. These prominence are really kind of odd looking. The head is behind the front leg here, and this is the tail. Uh, and... And some are diurnal, diurnal means during the day, and they fly around during the daytime. You know, the white striped black, I think 99 people out of 100 probably think that is a, a butterfly. It looks just like a butterfly, but it's actually a moth. In uh, the Virginia Teuncha, uh, really pretty with the iridescent colors, another day, one that flies during the day. In uh, white striped black, they fly around quite a bit. You could see them. These, this other one, the Virginia, it kind of just hangs out. You don't really see it, but if you look close enough, you'll find them. Uh, a <laughs> couple of uh, obviously named moss, the white slant line and the yellow slant line. Uh, so some miscellaneous moth nuggets about the moss. Um, most moths, adult moths, do not eat. Um, there's a few species that will drink uh, nectar from a, tea, a tree, like even in the spring, the, a maple tree, maple sap would be coming out and they'll drink that. Or you put some fruit out there, you might attract some moss. Um, some live only a few days. The bigger ones, those, the uh, Promethea that you saw earlier and the uh, Polyphemus, they might only live a few days. So they don't really have any, they don't do any eating and others live several months. And there are even a few, the ones that live longer, they actually do migrate. There are several species of moths that migrate and they migrate for the same reasons other animals migrate to find better habitat. Uh, they might migrate, you know, a few hundred miles from uh, where they were uh, hatched. <clears throat> Herald moth. Uh, that's one kind of a little bit interesting. Found that in my garage last November. And I go, this is an odd time of year to be finding a moth and such a uniquely colored moth. So I thought I did it a favor and I took it outside. Well, I read this year that moths, these herald moths, they actually go inside of garages and sheds and that's where they overwinter. So these, that particular moth overwinters as an adult. So I probably end up killing the thing, but uh, I'll know better next time. The arch hook tip. Very unique looking moth. So some of the more benefits to the moths. They are nature's hidden pollinators. Uh, the picture on the right is actually on our patio, one of the flowers we have in the pots. And go out to your flower garden you're with the nectar producing flowers with a flashlight at night. And I pretty much guarantee you'll see moths on those flowers, something you'll never see if you didn't go out there at night. Uh, nice, uniquely uh, shaped and kind of camouflaged almost, a pink shaded fern. And I'm not even going to pronounce that hollow spotted one. Uh, and some couple more pollinators, and I'm pretty sure everybody has seen these. Generally, people call them hummingbird moths. Actually, they're a, a clear wing moth. And there are two different species that are present around here, the hummingbird clearwing and the color and the snowberry clearwing. The coloration on the tail section is a little different. The wings, if I had a good photo of the wings, they have some sort of defining characteristics of the wings up on the uh, top portion of the wing. 
So uh, yeah, hopefully everybody gets to see those buzzing around their flower garden. Um, Velvet bean, I love that name, caterpillar. And the one on the right, giant leopard. That moth is pretty close to two inches tall. And this is, in this particular night, I had 16 of these on the sheet. So there must have been a female around. But look at these uh, bright fluorescent dots, green dots. I found out that these are defense discretion, defense uh, excretions. Um, I was kind of in the area. I can't remember what I was doing specifically, but he started to secrete these, uh, this liquid here. And it's, I guess it's a real bitter tasting liquid. So if there was a predator trying to get it, that once it tasted that, it would leave it alone. But that's, uh, I have not seen very many pictures like that. Um, some more benefits. Uh, as Jennifer brought up, their caterpillars are very important food source from birds, especially in the spring. Uh, some caterpillars or some birds uh, would eat, like they even said the chickadees, would, a nest of chickadees would eat like 3,000, 4,000 caterpillars per clutch of eggs each year. I mean, that's an amazing amount of caterpillars. So these caterpillars, they're eating, they're eating the plants and they're converting the plant energy to animal energy. So they are the bridge of, uh, from plant to animal. There's so many different species, especially birds that eat the uh, caterpillars. I saw this, I, uh, to me, I mean, it was almost as big as a hot dog. Uh, this was crawling across my lawn uh, one night and it's this Pandora sphinx moth. And the adult of that moth is that. Uh, some of these moths are really tame. As you can see, you could put them on your hands and others, just like any, you can't get close to them. As soon as you get close, they'll fly off or they don't want to be touched type of thing. All depends on the species. If you could pick them up, you could pick them up. Uh, so what is mothing and how does one get started? So, you know, mothing is like birding and a mother is like a birder. So uh, for me, back in 2019, on a warm spring night, uh, my wife and I were sitting out on the back patio and we had the porch lights on and, you know, you, every now and then you'll see a moth land on the house by the porch light. And I go, hmm, what's that? So uh, I started taking pictures of it and I'm already on iNaturalist. Hopefully everybody uses iNaturalist. And uh, I got to see, you know, what it was, trying to figure out what it was and did it again a couple of nights later the next week. And I got more and more species in uh before you know it, um, I'm up to 55 species in 2019. I, to me, I didn't know anything about moss at that time. To me, I was pretty impressed by that number. And I go, well, maybe next year I'll hit 100. Well, next year, uh, I added some different lights and I attracted a, an additional 232 different species. And Surely there can't be many more than that. Uh, well, this past year I added another 248 species. So I'm finding out that some right now I'm over 500. Some people in the state have 12, 1300 species uh, that they have cited on their property. So these are just on my property, not anywhere else. So I have a ways to go, but I'll keep trying. A couple more. I see a lot of tulip tree beauties with the tulip trees around and uh, another uniquely colored moth, pale metanema. So as I said, it's a pretty easy thing to do. You just all really need if you want to see some moths, a uh, porch light. Turn it on and you can sit back by your fire and see what comes. Um, if you start to see some and you really like what you're seeing, you could get a different kind of light and different kind of lights will attract different kind of moss. But not all lights are, are created equal. Um, the beautiful wood nymph on the right is one of the many species of moss that are supposed to look like bird droppings. So birds leave them or animals leave them alone, including birds. Uh, Uh, so why are moths attracted to light? Nobody really knows for sure. 
Um, some people theorize maybe it's because they use the moon to navigate. Uh, I've read one instance where uh, people believe that the lights trick the moths into seeing visual illusions of dark areas and lighter areas or the moths fly to what they think is a hiding place. Uh, and, but actually it's, it's a part of the whole light. I guess they don't see light like we see light. Uh, or maybe there's some other reasons that nobody really hasn't figured out yet, but uh, they certainly are attracted to light and it's not only moss either. Um, most people wouldn't think that these are moss. These are a type of plume moss, kind of hard to identify. There's a lot of similar looking species, uh, but you could see these during the day too. Uh, they're probably about an inch, inch across or so. So if you want to attract moss, you kind of have to uh, try to figure out what kind of light to use and the type of light greatly matters. And like I said, here, it's a science unto itself. And I really didn't know anything about, I never knew lighting was so complex until I started trying to attract moss. So one of the biggest things is the whiter the light, the better. We know that if you do not want to attract insects, you put a yellow light bulb outside and that keeps the insects away. Well, that's true, especially in the case of moss. So the moss would like to see light or see light the best that is down in this, this whiter end of the spectrum. Uh, and they measure the bulb color with a Kelvin temperature, K temp, it's not a heat type of temperature, it's a color temperature. And uh, so the higher the K temp, the more attractive it is to moss. Uh, and how you find out what the K temp is on a bulb, well, when you buy a bulb, you always have this lighting facts box on your box of lights. And down here, light appearance, warm to cool. So the lower the number would be the warmer readings. Uh, the higher number would be the cool. So here, this, this particular box was a 3000 K. So it would look something like that. And so it's not only the color of the bulb, it's the type of bulb, LED, compact fluorescent, incandescent. So LED is pretty much what everything is translating to now. Compact fluorescent used to be the rage 10 years ago. Those are the curly Q bulbs. Incandescent are the old style light bulbs that look like the ones on the screen here. Then you have the ultraviolet or black light, uh, which are could be any shape, but it throws out a different type of light that we'll talk about. Uh, a couple more different kind of cool looking moths. This, this one got the yellow and turquoise mohawk going. Another one you really can't tell the difference unless you dissect the moth. So at the risk of making everybody kind of look like this guy, their eyes glazed over, um, I don't want to get too much more into the lighting, the science of lighting, but I found that the old style incandescent bulbs, the classic looking bulbs, they probably, for basic bulbs, they work okay. And also the compact, compact fluorescent. LEDs really don't work very well. So I don't know what's going to happen when... Uh, incandescent and compact fluorescent go away, be tougher for, I guess, the lay person to attract moths. But if you start to get into it and get serious, the best bulb you could buy is the black light or UV bulb. And uh, they're very cheap. They're easy to obtain. You go to Walmart for $10, you could get one of the long fluorescent tubes uh, you have to figure out what the, what to mount it on, and I'll show you a little bit. Uh, and that will bring in a wide variety of moss, very effective. And even if you're more serious, uh, the mercury vapor is the premier moth attracting, has a very wide spectrum of light that it throws. Uh, but they're hard, kind of hard to find. And the metal halide is what I have. Um, couple, everybody probably should recognize the Luna moth, and this is some type of Zale, another one's hard to identify. And people kind of wonder, you know, where the moths during the day? 
Well, this Luna moth I found when I was out pulling garlic mustard, pulled up a handful of garlic mustard and this Luna moth was underneath the plants. And this Zale, I uh, saw him late last summer, early fall, I was cutting firewood and I rolled over a log and he was under the log. So they are hanging out in the woods during the daytime under bark, under leaves, under plants and waiting for nighttime to come out. Um, so if you wanna see a lot of different types of moss, obviously, you need to have a lot of different types of uh, habitat around. And it doesn't take Einstein to, to, to know that if you want uh, a lot of moss, you have to have a lot of different moss around and how to get a, a lot of them around uh, the different types of habitat. Woods is by far the best or the greatest attractor, the greatest uh, source of moss. Um, there are some moss that, you know, that, prefer grassland, some moss that per, prefer the plants in wetland. So it's all about the host plants. Uh, if you're, that moth is eating cherry leaves or oak leaves or ash leaves, you know, they're going to be found in the woods. If that moss is eating different types of, you know, goldenrod and ironweed or sedges, they'll be found out in the field and in the wetlands. So the more types of habitat, the more types of moss you're going to get. Um, so if you don't have a lot of woods around, it's going to really help hurt your ability to see moss, but you could always bring in moss, uh, plant, do some research, find out what plants or host plants for those moss. And if you saw some of the, uh, presentation that Jennifer did and I did before about, you know, planet, they will come. It's very true. It's amazing that they come out of nowhere basically to find that host plant to lay their eggs and for have their caterpillars eat those leaves and don't forget about overwintering cover i mean people think of well host plants and moss in the summertime but those moss have to survive the winter they have to be out there in all this snow and surviving so they need to have leaf cover leaf litter uh, brush piles uh, don't cut down your flowers all the way down to the the base until you know to start growing in the spring leave all that mess out there so to speak and that's where the moth either in the adult form or in the larva form will overwinter uh, and speaking of host plants i happen to have a lot of uh, sweet bush on my property and sweet bush is one of the host plants uh, for the promethea moth and when we walk the dog in the morning down the driveway i've noticed this caterpillar hanging from the spice bush and I go, well, I wonder when that thing's going to hatch. And lo and behold, uh, last two summers ago on the 4th of July, morning of the 4th of July, born on the 4th of July, this moth, we saw it when we first walked by, it would look like this. And I go, holy mackerel. Ha I had no idea how long it's going to take to get out of there. So we, we walked the dog and I got, I don't know, a couple hundred yards away. And I told my wife, I have to go back and check on the moth. I went back and... It was probably 15 minutes later, he was like this, then another five minutes, he was out and ready to go. And you could tell it's a male because of the darker the coloration. So that was pretty exciting for me at least. Uh, so if you're really um, getting into this uh, and you want to do more than just having a porch light on, uh, and if you ever been to the, the moth night for Portage Parks last year, you see that we hang white sheets up and all mothers, they would hang a white sheet up and that gives the moth a target and a place to land. Um, some moths, a few of them aren't attracted to light and they would come to a mix of uh, sugar and fruit, fermented, fermented fruit and sugar. Uh, it's, I really don't have much luck with it. I've, I've attracted a few, but it's uh, kind of messy and a lot harder than just putting a light up. And uh, some moths do overwinter as adults. Uh, two years ago, while plowing the driveway of snow, a moth landed on my driveway during the winter. And uh, it was, I'm not sure what kind it was, but it was just kind of a one of those drab looking ones. But any of the days when they get above 40 degrees, uh, they might be active, especially when you have warm winter nights that are above 40 degrees. One example is the Bruce fanworm. It's uh, one of the winter moths, so to speak. 
Uh, you'll see these in the fall and it can be pretty, pretty cold out and it'll, they'll still be out there. Um, here are the setup. So the one on the left is the, the black light. And unfortunately the wind was blown and it's blown up against the light, but uh, I put it actually on an electric fence stake that I found at Lowe's. I go, oh, this would work out. So I put the, hard to see, but the uh, fluorescent tube is attached to this white stake and the stake you just push in the ground with your foot. It's a metal post on the bottom, metal peg. And behind it is this light. This is my other light is a metal halite. I bought this for like 30 some bucks from Amazon. I had a cord laying around down in the basement. I tapped, direct wired it to the cord, put it on a piece of treated lumber. Now it's waterproof. I could keep this out there during the rain where I can't keep this uh, black light out in the rain. But this uh, metal halide light is on the other side of the sheet. You could do any combination. Moths don't care. You could put one light on one sheet and another light on the other sheet or experiment around, see what's best. Uh, but this was a combination. And you can see this was a particularly good night. A lot of moss. Most of them are lesser maple spanworms. These, uh, they're kind of white drabby looking things, but there's some other ones in there. A uh, couple more. This one here, this Nessus Sphinx was inside the house. He's actually, that's the, my fireplace mantle. Um, I caught him with my, I don't know how I got in the house, but I caught him with my hand. It felt like a bumblebee in my hand. It was so really a powerful flyer, this one. You can see their great big abdomen and they, they fly like the hummingbird moss. Uh, best time to see them. Buggy, buggy and muggy, as they say, the warm, calm, humid nights. It's best if you didn't have a moon to compete with your light source. Uh, but regardless of the weather, you really probably always will see something, but when you get those warm, calm, and humid nights, those are the, the best ones for insects in general. Uh, some of them show up right away. As soon as it gets dark, you put the light on and boom, there's moss. The bigger ones, they tend to come out in the, uh, you know, after midnight. Uh, some of them will land right at dark and you wake up and they'll be on the same spot on the sheet in the morning. Uh, other ones, they'll come, check out what's going on, and uh, and move on. Another one is a tame sink moth. Um, so when's the best time to see them? Uh, they have what they call flight period, just the time of year when they're, uh, you know, on wing, so to speak. Um, some moss, like I said before, they might only be active or uh, have a flight period just in a couple weeks out of one month. And, uh, you know, a couple last two weeks of June might be the only time you would see a Luna moth, for example. But um, other ones, you'll see them from, you know, spring to fall. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, they'll, they'll, you'll see some in April, but like with the, when the plants start coming out, May, June, July are the three peak months. August is decent, and they'll just they'll start dwindling after uh, August through September. Even October, you'll still see them, but uh, the three the summer months are the peak. A couple cool looking moths. They look almost the same, but they're they're different. Uh, great big furry legs type of thing. Uh, so now you see one, this is the fun part. Now when you see one, you want to figure out, well, so at least I do, I want to know what it is. And it all starts with a good quality photo and I can't stress that enough. You have to have a good picture. Sure, you could see a Luna moth and oh, I don't need a picture, I know what it is. Yeah, but nine times out of 10, you're going to need a good picture. Uh, if you, I, I use a cell phone, very handy. It's already geotagged, you know, where your location is. Uh, you don't have to set up big lenses and tripods. Uh, but you got to make sure your picture's focused. And sometimes, you know, I get caught up in the moment. I start snapping all these pictures. Oh, there's one, there's one. And the next day I look and, ah, oh, it's all blurry. Um, so after you take the picture, just make sure it's, it's focused. When you got a good focused picture, uh, then you could crop or zoom in on your picture. Hopefully everybody knows how to do that. You go to, you know, you click on your picture, you hit edit, and you could size the photo uh, in uh, 
frame it to the size. You don't want a photo with a little tiny moth in the middle that you can't see it, you know, zoom in on it. And that's where the better phones help out. We'll talk about that. Uh, yeah, you don't want a picture like this one. I took this one off the internet of, you know, people submit these on iNaturalist and you'll see them and like, you know, what's this? Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, and, and if you start doing it for a while, you'll start seeing a moss and, oh, I, I seen that one. I have that one. But take the picture anyway. I can't tell you the number of times that I thought I had that one before. And here it is just something a little bit different. And it's a new species. Um, the gold spotted goat, that is a uh, species of concern, that moth, uh, meaning the next step, I believe, would be uh, endangered, I think. Uh, so it's not real common. It showed up last night for last night, I wish, uh, last year for just a few minutes. Uh, it was there, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. Then it took off, but I got some good pictures of it. And it's a pretty good size moth, probably close to inch and a half, maybe two inches uh, lengthwise. Uh, really neat looking the moth. Very common, the large maple spanworms. You'll see a lot of those, and they're all different kinds of colors on those. So getting with the cell phone, um, up until this year, I used the iPhone 6, and I kind of struggled with my pictures. This year, I finally broke down. I got an iPhone 13, and it's really night and day, the picture-taking taking capability uh, with the new phone versus the old phone. Uh, there's a lot more uh, megabytes per picture. You could zoom in a lot better, crisper picture. Uh, the low light capability is better on the new phones. Uh, yeah, and you don't have to, uh, you know, get real close to the moth to take the picture. You could take it kind of from far away and zoom in and crop it and get a good uh, picture of the moth. Um, another thing that I do, I use a, a headlamp that casts a, a pure white light. And sometimes there's just not enough light around outside at night, obviously, to take a good picture. So you use a headlamp with a white light. You don't want to use one with a yellowish light that's going to change the color of the moth and you take the picture. So again, make sure, like making sure it's in focus, making sure after you take the picture, look at it, does this moth in my camera look like the one I just took the picture of? So make sure the color is true to the moth. Uh, one of the many tiger moths, the virgin tiger, that they have a lot more of these thin lines on their wings than some of the other tiger moths, but a lot of moth species has really neat looking underwings that you never typically see unless they spread their wings. This is the forewing and that'd be the hind wing or the underwing. Uh, one issue you run into if you're using the black light is, you know, it makes everything an odd color. So turn it off when you take a picture or uh, if you don't want to turn it off, you could cover it. I use a big piece of cardboard sometimes, just place that in between the moth and the light. And uh, then it you know, gets rid of that ultraviolet light. Uh, and I have difficulty, probably that's where you're better off with a, or you're better off with a better camera, but taking a picture of a dark moth on a light background is very difficult for the camera. But you have a, a big patch of white with a little moth in there. Uh, dark moss, it doesn't handle that very well. So you, you'll struggle with that. That's where the headlamp certainly helps or in turning off the, uh, the light source or covering it. One of my favorites, the small eyed sphinx. Again, you can't see the eyes and the wings are closed. And these pictures don't, don't do it justice, but they're really iridescent colors, fairly calm. I see them quite a few of them. How you find out what you see. Um, uh, the old fashioned way is with the Peterson's guide uh, paper. Um, this guide is the only field guide for moss in northeast, the northeastern United States. So uh, widely available on Amazon type of things. <clears throat> and it's nice because uh, I'll I think I have a slide coming up. Um, it gives you the locations of markings on the wings to have some, uh, you'll see, uh, you know, how do you tell if it's this, that? Well, look for this spot, that spot, this line type of thing. 
and also now it's smartphones, um, they really do a pretty good job of identifying moss. iNaturalist, which most people already use, hopefully. <clears throat> and the other one is the LEPS app. Uh, if you put in LEPS in your uh, app store, you'll come up with a cartoon. Well, scroll down a little bit. You don't want the cartoon or comment, whatever it is. You want the LEPS for Lepidiatry Field Guide by Lepidiatry by Field Guide. Uh, so this app is specifically geared towards moths and butterflies. Uh, so in my opinion, it does a better job than iNaturalist. It probably gets them right 80% of the time. iNaturalist maybe 60, 70% of the time. Once in a while, iNaturalist will get it and the LEPS app doesn't get it. Pretty rare. Uh, once in a while, neither of them can figure out what it is. Uh, a couple more, show you emerald and a grapevine looper. This could be either a greater or lesser grapevine looper. Either, again, you need uh, dissection. Uh, but some words of warning, um, don't blindly accept the answer from smartphone app. Uh, I go on iNaturalist quite a bit and I try to help out people identify moths. I'm certainly no expert, I'm a rookie, but I look for the easy ones. And so many times people just, you know, the first thing that iNaturalist pops up, boom, that's what they put in there. Well, you gotta spend a little bit more time than that. Uh, so what I do is I, I use the apps, they put you in the ballpark or they'll get it right. But then I use uh, the book and some other websites that we'll talk about and uh, confirm or deny if that's the moss. Uh, one thing when using iNaturalist, make sure that moth is found in the Eastern United States. One of the first ones I ID'd, it was a European species. And I never even bothered to look at the range or where it's found. And I put it down and some lady you know, wrote back and said, well, no, that's only found in Europe. Well, I learned my next lesson. So make sure it's found around here, uh, or at least in the Eastern US. And if you get crazy like me, sometimes a measurement helps. Unfortunately, oftentimes you find out you need a measurement the following day and you're gonna try to figure it out what it is. But some species are kind of, they look almost identical except for their size. So in this case, you know, everything is in millimeters. So have a millimeter scale, hold it by the moth, take a picture. And that, might, that may or may not help you identify the moth. My favorite, Saw these for the first time this year, this hairy beast, uh, large tulipi, uh, just incredible looking moth with all the fur, whatever you want to call it, but pretty cool. Uh, they're probably a uh, inch, inch and a half maybe from tip to tail. And what I believe is a white mark tussock. Obviously you get these two little white dots but not 100% sure on that. But also another cool one, you can see the antennas on this one, pretty cool looking. Uh, so I gotta get moving here. Um, the type of ID tools would be three main websites that we, we use to identify moss. And hope I don't mess this up too much. So I want to do that. I want to do. Are you seeing my screen, Jennifer? Right. I can see your. I can see your browser. So I see the digital yeah. guide to moth ID. Oh, okay. Job. So, so this is uh, this is one of them. This is the moth photography group. Uh, use this quite a bit. You can put in, uh, M most people call it MPG for moth photography group. And it gives you the moths, where they're found, the scientific name, and a lot of pictures. And from this one, you could click on, they'll always have links to the bug guide. Bug guide is kind of, I guess the authoritative 
website for bugs. Uh, and you get a lot of information there. They'll give you identification descriptions. Uh, and they'll also give you what, see also what other moths look similar to this moth. And a lot more pictures, pictures of the caterpillars and uh, range maps where they're found. And lastly, like I can, uh, Uh, butterflies and moss in North America. North America. Uh, again, another website that uh, has examples and range maps. And let's take it back. So for both bug guide and uh, butterflies and moths in North America, you could submit your photos. If they have, if you have questions on what it is, but so many people do that nowadays. Bug guide, I submitted one back in July. Still haven't heard anything. Uh, butterflies and moths, they probably a lot less submissions than bug guide because bug guide is doing every insect out there. Uh, you could also submit photos to them. Whoops. Um, but another source is you join the face group, Facebook group Mothing Ohio. And you can submit photos on there. I'm, I joined this year and I'm on there quite a bit. Uh, and people, runs the gamut from people that really know their stuff on there to people that just, what is this butterfly? You know, they think it's a butterfly or they have no idea what it is. Um, so that, that's something you could certainly look into the Mothing Ohio, you have to request to join that. Uh, I bet some of you have seen this moth. You know, some people call it the crucifix moth. Uh, Climini, I believe how it's pronounced. And actually these are both the same species. I found the one on the right last year. I got all excited. I thought I had something new, but uh, here it's actually the same species as that. A little bit of the yellow and the hind or underwing uh, gave it away. So if you wanna learn about identifying moss, you have to learn a whole new vocabulary. I'm not gonna read this. But oftentimes on those websites, they'll give you a description. And the description has these words in here like subterminal and basal area and distal edge and inner margin. Like, what the heck are they talking about? Uh, in the Peterson guidebook, they have a page that kind of uh, shows a lot of these different areas. But this just scratches the surface of all the different parts of the wing that people call out for identification purposes. So I went online and you could actually, you know, Google up what moth wing parts or butterfly wing parts, and you'll get even more terms to, to use. Uh, pretty neat one, Laurel Sphinx, one of my favorites. <clears throat> so as I said, sometimes it's easy, see a Luna moth, you know what it is. Sometimes it takes a lot of time to figure out uh, one good thing about being retired, I could try to figure out what all these moths are that I see. Um, or you could do it over the winter. A lot of people do stuff over the winter on iNaturalist and they'll take the pictures in the summertime, work on them identifying in the winter and submit them during the winter. Uh, sometimes you'll never know what it is if the moth is too worn uh, or just not, not a good, you don't get a good picture of it. You, or you can't really tell what it is because there's so many similar species. Uh, and it's like this one in the bottom right. I thought I had a pretty good picture. I still haven't figured out what this is. It might be a type of slug moth, but I'm not sure. And I really like the rare ones. I mean, the big ones are nice, but I get excited when I find something that you don't typically find around here. And uh, I got one of those last year don't know how to pronounce it, but this is it. This is my palm of my hand. And it had a neither the uh, I naturalist nor the Lepsap knew what it was. So I just ended up clicking through thousands of pages of the moth photography group and finally found something that looked like it. So according to moth photography group, there's there's a handful found in the eastern US, nothing around Ohio. Here's the iNaturalist sighting. 
Uh, when I, this is my dot, that's me. Um, when I entered mine in there, there's only one down in Kentucky. This one has since been entered in. So there's only three on there. And on the bug guide range map, it only has the Kentucky sighting, nothing else. So I sent this to the butterflies and moss in North America. They confirmed my suspicion of what it was. They said, you're right, this is what it is. So I got the first recorded species of this in Ohio. So to me, that's exciting. A couple more, I think this is probably the female and the male, Hickory Tusket, Oak Besma. And you have the dreaded unknowns. Like I said, it's, it's the moss, as they get older, they get more worn, uh, they get faded, they lose their coloration, uh, and it's real hard to tell what the heck they are. Uh, some of them, the variability in coloration is uh, amazing that they're the, still the same species. So hopefully I don't screw this up. Let me go back to... So this is the one spotted variant. These are all the same species, aptly named one spotted variant, all the same species here. And this is just a few of them. You could go on and on. They're all, it's probably pretty hard to find two that ever look alike. So they call it like the snowflake moth or something, but uh, uh, very common moss, but very, um, a lot of variability in the coloration. Um, and like I said before, some of them, they look so much alike, you have to dissect them. I, I'm not into dissection. I don't do that. I drew the line there. Uh, and sometimes you own, you'll be lucky only to determine the, the genus level. Uh, so you have, if you remember your order, of, um, you have the order, then you have family, some family. So the order is Lepidiatra which is moth and butterflies, and you have family and subflamies, tribe, genus, and finally you get down to the species. So sometimes genus is the best you could do, maybe not even that sometimes, where you just can't tell by visually looking at them. This American lappet, pretty cool looking shaped moth. Again, the head is here. Part of the, like this protuberance where the wing is, the legs underneath it. Um, so one thing is for certain, if you try to identify as moth, you'll eventually will get some wrong. I might even have some wrong identified on here, but in, uh, in this, on the Seinfeld episode, not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, if, if you're gonna try to do it and look at them, somewhere along the line, you're gonna make a mistake, and, but there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Cause some species are so similar. Here's a page out of the Peterson's guide. These are six different species. Uh, to me, they all look pretty similar. And remember, these are um, you know these are perfect specimens. You don't see these all that often uh, in the wild. The ones you'll see that they'll be tattered and battered and old and worn, and this really makes identification uh, difficult. Uh, my classic, I love that the IO moss. Pretty common. You'll get them for a couple week period. You'll see quite a few of them, and. Uh, yeah, once they, you could just touch them with your finger and they'll open their wings and you'll see these eyeballs that kind of scare predators away. Uh, so naming is a big, a big deal kind of, uh, most moths have a common name, but all moths has a, a unique scientific name. Like the one that I found that was the rare one that didn't have a common name because it's really not a common moth. Uh, So, the, and some moss may have more than one common name. But this guy, Ronald Hodges, bless his heart, he developed a numbering system that's unique. He uses a unique number instead of a name for moss. So it's called the Hodge number or Mona number, moss in North America. And for me, it's certainly easier to pronounce. There's no confusion over the common names and you're less apt to make a mistake when typing in some scientific name. So this particular moth, there's one picture and there's another one. Uh, most people will call it a hologram moth. This picture doesn't do it justice. This, this green patch is kind of iridescent and when you, light hits it, it's uh, kind of like a mirror almost, um, like a hologram. So, uh, like I said, a hologram moth, if you go on 
moth photography group or bug guy, they call it a green patch looper. Uh, also another name is a, a large brussy baluca. But scientifically, it's uh, known as the Acrusa baluca. Uh, only one scientific name, even though it might have three, four more uh, common names or Hodge's number is 8897. So if you don't want to type in all that stuff, just say I saw 8897, but that's pretty uh, kind of hard to remember those numbers, but certainly for conversing with somebody, uh, typing it in on uh, a website, a lot of times you can just search for that number and you'll come up with the moth. Another black and white moth that's uh, kind of camouflaged is the bird dropping. And the one on the right, probably most people never see the adult, but everybody sees the woolly bear caterpillar. Well, that's what a woolly bear caterpillar turns into, the Isabella tiger moth. <clears throat> so if you, if you wanna keep track of what you see, um, I, I didn't for a while, I just used iNaturalist to keep whatever I entered in the iNaturalist, that's was kind of my, how I kept track of it. And, after a while, it was kind of cumbersome to figure out if I've seen it before. So I started a, uh, well, yeah, I mean, and, and, and also, if you don't know, when you symmetize naturalists, other people go on there and look at your moth and they could agree with you or not agree or tell you it's from Europe and you're wrong. But uh, if you want to go a little, take a step further, I started doing the spreadsheet. You could put whatever you want on your spreadsheet. It's your spreadsheet. Uh, here's just a clip of my moss number 22 through 26. I have the common name, the scientific name, the Hodges number, the date that I saw it. I have a yes or no, if, whoops, if it's been confirmed by iNaturalist. I have the page number. Uh, the Peterson guide, if I want to find it real good, real quick, if I want to find my arch hook tip, I go to page 177. And, I'll, and I also have a hyperlink to my iNaturalist page that has the sighting on it. Then you can have a comment section over here, the army worm, another common name is the white speck. Put whatever you want on it, but that has served me pretty well. Uh, running out of time but uh, pepper moth and some of them this one actually come same moth it's a melanistic all black moth here some close-ups here the uh antenna i talked about earlier so whether they're on you could get some pretty neat close-ups of moss uh, and you have some moth look-alikes some things out there you'll see on your sheets that I think that's a moth. One of the biggest offenders, I guess, are the, the caddis flies. These, the two on the top are caddis flies. And this one on the bottom is actually a moth. I think it's a tawny verbia. But I figured, I'm not sure if I'm right or not, but the way I differentiate is with the antenna, the caddis fly antenna. I haven't read this anywhere, but they stick straight out. Both of them, you can see them sticking straight out. Whereas the, the moth antenna kind of more upright, but that's what I figured out. But the, one of the big uh, benefits, or not benefits, but the surprises of mothing is there's other creatures out there in the night that you've probably never seen during the daytime and you might attract them to your, your moth sheet. Some of us might've seen the Dobson fly. I believe that's the female with the smaller, pretty big critter there. Spring peeper coming in for a free meal. Giant water bug. Um, I was surprised I got him, but you can see about the size of the blades of grass. He's, I don't know, two, two and a half inches. He's a big bug. Dark banded fish fly. I thought that was a moth one time. He's probably at least three inches, maybe, yeah, probably three, three and a half inches. I like this grapevine beetle. It looks like a, a Volkswagen beetle. Probably a good solid inch, but really hefty. Uh, 
another kind of beetle that you see every now and then, another half your finger size. Uh, I thought these were pretty cool. It's a type of mantid fly. It looks like a praying mantis with the front legs, kind of praying mantis-like. Uh, I'm not sure of the species on it, but uh, you know what I want to point out. This is, I took this picture with the black light on. You could see that the uh, uh, the discoloration that the black light causes when you try to take a picture. So it's best to turn the black light off when you take a picture. And here, Jennifer's favorite, the round neck sexton beetle. It's a type of a, a burrowing, bearing beetle. And we saw this at the uh, Portage Parks Moth Night last year. And it has these little mites on its head. And the mites, they're not parasitic. They're just simply hitching a ride to this along this beetle. And it goes to other dead things and tries to bury them. And it also, uh, you know, uh, these beetle, these mites, I think they lay their eggs there too. I might have this all wrong, but these mites will feed on the, eggs of any of the competitors of this beetle. So it's kind of a symbiotic relationship here. They're not hurting the beetle. They're just hitching a ride to the next dead thing that it finds. But you never know what you might see out there. But this is kind of, this is, this is what I dream about. But this picture is uh, in Indonesia. And it seems like some nights, you never see this many in Ohio. But uh, there's some nights when you'll get midges, midges and caddisflies and mayflies, and you'll get a lot of bugs, bugs buzzing around, uh, buzzing around your your sheets. So if you don't like uh, a lot of bugs, uh, you might have to look for another another hobby. But it's never it's never this bad. But I thought this picture is interesting. Uh, and yeah. For me, uh, you need to be a responsible mother. Um, I like to leave, I leave my, most of the time I leave my lights on all night and I wake up in the morning and see what's there. Granted, I miss a lot of moths that way, but it's a lot easier than trying to stay up two o'clock every morning. But remember, birds like moss. So if you leave your sheet out there and your lights on all night, and you don't wake up till nine o'clock, chances are the birds are gonna have eaten your moss. So you need to get up before the sun rises. And I you know, take whatever pictures and I take my sheets down, take them out in the woods, shake them out where there's the moss could go, go for cover in the woods as opposed to on your lawn uh, and make sure the birds don't uh, eat your moss. And every now and then, you know, turn the lights off. There's been studies about how the lights affect and suppress moth activity and affect other insects, you know, too many light pollution type of things. So every now and then have a light-free night. And uh, so my next to the last slide here, these are two moths that we saw last year at the Portage Parks uh, Moth Night. Um, sweet fern geometer. I have never seen this one before at my place as that was a new species for me. And I've only seen this uh, zebra conchalodes uh, one other time at my house, but this is fairly, fairly uh, uh, uncommon moth around the area, but it's a really neat looking moth. So there it is. Uh, that's you know, it's a great way to experience the world that you know few other people have seen. There's just so much stuff out there at night. It's really, really interesting. And uh, if you want to see how we do it in the, in person in action, uh, we're going to have a couple of moth nights this year, and Jennifer will announce those. And uh, I think that's it for my presentation. And four minutes over. Hey, great job. <laughs> Excellent work. So I do have questions for you, Joe, a number of questions. I'm going to start off with a couple comments. So uh, isn't that fascinating? I, 
I think it's amazing how many different, uh, be it moths or plants or you know, any other group of organisms that we have in Portage County, sometimes just pausing and looking. And once you start zoning in and learning, you realize how much you don't know and um, how much more there is to, is to learn. So lots of mysteries of nature that are still out there. Um, so thank you, Joe, for sharing. Um, Larry wanted to remind um, too, that UV light can cause cataracts, can contribute to that. So be careful on your UV light exposure. And the other comment that I have here from Jan, um, thanks for the great presentation. Um, she wanted to see how amazed she was at the number of moths around and how beautiful your pictures are, Joe. So I agree, I agree, it is really incredible. So let's get some questions here. Okay. Uh, We'll start with the, the maps um, and the range maps. The question is, uh, when you showed the maps of moths, um, she noticed that there were not many out west. Is that due to the climate out west versus east? Or is it the range uh, the, um, the guy? Uh, yeah, a lot of the moths are found either in the western US or in the eastern US. I mean, some are found across the country. So that particular map i think that was the um, one spotted variant there at eastern an eastern moth but um i'm not sure how many species they have out there i think it's uh i think it's probably i'm not sure i shouldn't say but i think it's, it's basically just where the moths are geographically located in that one if you could click through that you could go to that moth photography group website and click through all the moths or some of them and you'll see they're they're all over the place but that was that particular one that was just found primarily in the east. And sometimes that helps you identify it. If you come up with an answer that's only found out in California, well, it's not going to be the bright moth. Good. And how do you tell a male from a female moth? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Um, some, <laughs> some you can tell and some you can't tell. Some, some are size difference, some are coloration difference. I think, uh, um, Mostly it's, it's coloration, but I haven't really, uh, and there's really, I would have to say the vast majority of them, you really can't tell unless you dissect them, but I haven't gotten to that level of male and female. There's just a few that I know that are obvious in coloration. Yeah, that's the big, it depends. As yeah. long as the moss know, they're fine. <laughs> and how about the, uh, thinking of daytime, the diurnal moths? Um, if the night, the moths that are out, uh, the nocturnal ones are out at night, uh, are attracted to light, what are the daytime moths attracted to? Um, I think they're, well, um, I, I don't know for sure, but I think, I mean, it's most, a lot of times it'd be the flowers and the nectars mm -hmm. and the host plants there. They're looking to create their next uh, batch of young. So they're either laying eggs on the host plants. They're, they're doing whatever activity it is that moths do, whether it is, I mean, not all moths. I think that the light thing is like a human thing that we created and infringed on their world. But typically if we weren't here with the lights, they're gonna be out looking for mates and or food if they're a type of moth that eats or laying eggs on their host plants type of stuff, just being a moth. Mm -hmm. And uh, Robert, I think we, Joe answered your question, sharing some of his resources that he uses to identify moths. I just wanted to drive home the point that Joe made that um, it's really important not to rely on, you know, one site or, you know, one resource to confirm an identification that you're not, you know, something that you're not familiar with, because there can be so many different variations in markings um, and, cross-referencing, you know, it's not just, you know, one, I have one resource and I'm going to go with that. It's really cross-referencing um, all of the resources that are out there to try and figure out. And then, and then sometimes sending it to, you know, the experts who confirm or deny your, you know, your right. theory. And one of the uh, experts, I can't remember his name, but he, he's, he is a literal expert. He's up in New England. And I remember somebody asked for his opinion and his answer was, he goes, I've seen too much now to know what it is. So yeah. like the more you see, the more you know, the more you realize you really don't know type of thing. And there's mm -hmm. so much variability out there. Yeah. 
And then uh, Becca and Graham had uh, two que Graham had two questions. So one um, about the moths that don't eat. Do they have a shorter lifespan than the moths that do eat? And uh -huh. A part two of that is do those moths that don't eat, do they still contribute to pollination? So the first one, I'm pretty sure that is the case. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the ones that I've noticed are that they have a bigger body mass. So they're living off their, their fat and their body of the bigger moths. So they're really not eating, but they have enough mass to survive for a few days. And uh, so I, I don't think even now, if they don't eat, they don't, a lot of them don't have mouth parts, so they're not even doing any pollinating, uh, as far as I know. So there's um, pollinating is still, well, it can be still be eating if they're actually sipping the nectar too from the flowers, but they're, they're kind of a two part. Uh, maybe you know more than that than I do on this is a two part thing where they're drinking the nectar from the flower, but also at the same time, they're catching the pollen on their feet or wings and moving it to another flower yeah it's accidental cool? pollination in a lot of cases where it's just yeah. happened to you know catch some when they're visiting the flower nectar which is the strategy for the, the flower for the plant too it's pretty smart stick that nectar all the way down at the base that they have to brush up against it to move it from one to the other um question about your observations uh, did you observe any difference with the number of moths that were seen in 2019 versus later in 2020 during the pandemic? Uh, no, I really can't answer that because I, I keep changing my, my setup. Like my first year, I just had the basic porch light. And the next year, I went to the UV light. And then this past year, I went to the metal halide. So I keep changing my conditions. So I really can't. I could tell I'm getting different types of moths because of different types of light, but I can't tell numbers, but if, I'm not sure if you're referring to me or the mothing world in general, there are more people that are mothing now because they're in the pandemic mode. Is that, I'm not sure what they're getting at. Well, I wonder, and uh, Robert, you can clarify um, if I'm incorrect, but I was, uh, I was thinking, you know, we've seen a lot of pictures of areas that were, you know, used to be like lit up and lots of people. And then during the pandemic, we had less light that, you know, that was um, and less activity. And do we see a difference, um, you know, difference uh, from then to now? So, and I don't know the answer to that in terms of moths. Yeah. I'm, I'm all my moths are just in my yard. So I'm really not sure what's going on outside of my yard, other than my neighbor put up these humongous spotlights that drive me crazy. But Oh, good. Uh, and, and a question for this upcoming year, Joe, what are, do you have any changes that um, you have planned for the upcoming year in your moth, mothing setup? No sleep for the whole summer. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm going to keep, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of things you could tinker with, like the different types of material on your sheets and maybe more of the I might do more of the light combinations where I have both the black light and the metal halite on the same sheet, but uh, no, not real big plant, any, no, no major changes. Excellent. Well, okay. I'm gonna try, but I am gonna try some uh, debate, debating more. See, cause some, like I said before, the some moss will not come to light. They'll only come to nectar or rotten fruit. So make some bait concoctions and see if I could get some different species that way. So nice. that's, that's my change. Well, we're looking forward to hopefully seeing some of you at our mothing programs that'll be coming up later this year. So watch our newsletter. Hopefully everybody that's on here has already signed up and uh, pay attention to the things to do page on our website. And you'll know when those are coming up. So Joe, thank you so thank much sharing with everybody, um, sharing your passion for moths and, you know, maybe spurring on uh, some others to, to get excited about yeah. the moth world. Yeah. And if they're, if they are somewhat interested, I, I would recommend that the, uh, the Mothing Ohio Facebook page, I mean, you could see what other people are seeing and they talk about identification just to get your feet wet type of thing. You don't have to post anything, but just to look at that. So good way to start out. Okay. Excellent. Well, have a great night, everyone. Thanks so much.